This podcast deals with violence and contains graphic descriptions that may be triggering for sensitive listeners. Snake Park is on the outskirts of Soweto. The township is almost surrounded by large hills. When the wind blows, a cloud of dust moves over the area and the fine grains make their way through the doors and windows of the shacks and houses. The hills are not made by nature. They are not even hills. They are mine dumps, gigantic mounds left over from the many mines in the area. Most of them are closed, but the dumps remain, and with them, the toxic chemicals left over from the mining. Researchers and activists claim that the remnants can cause serious health problems. For instance, asthma, chronic bronchitis, cancer, cerebral palsy, and learning disabilities. Next to the dumps, reporter Rasmus Bits meets a young man who is pushing a black trash can on wheels down the long road that runs between the shacks and the dusty felt. My name is Msimelelo Dilato. I'm living in Block 5, Snook Park. Here, I'm pushing my dustbin. I'm just hustling, you see. There's group like this. You see? So I'm hustling to get these things like this. Msimelelo is collecting empty plastic containers that he sells to make money to feed his habit. Because I'm a drug user, I'm an addict. I suffer, I relapse. Then I go to church. Even last Sunday, I, got, I went to church, you see. I pray every day. I want to quit smoke. I want to go, go do things right, you see. What drugs do you use? Me, I'm, I'm using heroin. <laughs> you see, yes, I'm using heroin. Other drugs I'm not using. Msimelelo is what people here call a nyaupe boy. Nyaupe itself is a drug, a cheap form of heroin, often mixed with other substances. Nyaupe boys are the young men using it. But it's also a term that is often thrown around to describe unknown criminals. If no one knows who stole something or stabbed someone, people will say it was probably a nyaupe boy. The problem is that from morning, ne? if I didn't smoke, I won't do nothing. Because they say one is, one is too many, thousand is not enough. How much money do you have to get every day? A day I have to smoke maybe five packs every day. 150 a day. Okay, okay now. That's fine. Thank you. Drug users like Msimelelo are blamed for many things in Snake Park. Also for events that led to Spiwa's death. You will hear one of them later. But is it really fair to blame xenophobia on Nyaupe boys? Or are they rather convenient scapegoats for deeper issues? You're listening to One Night in Snake Park. My name is Elod Maleva. The Mahori House is just around the corner from the Waka Waka shop in Block 8 in Snake Park. The shop where the unrest that led to Spewer's death began in 2015. This is not the wealthy part of Soweto, the part tourists visit to see Nelson Mandela's house. There are no tourists here, no formal restaurants, not even a supermarket. The only shops here are spazas. Traditionally, hole-in-a-wall businesses run from a local family's house. Today, South Africa's spaza market is no longer only local. Somalis, Ethiopians, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis own a large part. Since many locals don't distinguish between the different nationalities, they are often referred to as Pakistanis, regardless of their background. Outside the gate of the Mahori House, an old white Toyota Cressida is parked. The car belongs to Dan, Spiwa's father, and you can usually find him here sitting on a makeshift seat on the sidewalk, relaxing or fixing the car. 
While a funeral procession passes by in the background, Dan tells us about how he had high hopes for his son. My heart is painful when I think about Spiwe, Dan tells us. Dan taught him how to fix cars, but he never took him fishing. Inside the yard, behind the metal gate, four shacks surround the small cinder block house where the Mahoris live. Like many others in the township, they make a living by renting out shacks in their yard. I'm here with my colleagues, Tanya Pampoloni and Rasmus Bits. Spiwe's mother, Nombuiselo, greets us, holding their newborn baby, the Nyeko. The name is Tsonga, the first language of Spiwe's father, Dan, and it means gift. I should point out that this is also the same meaning as Spiwe, which, literally translated, means we are given. The Mahoris have two other children, an older daughter and a son, a boy who is a few years younger than Spiwe. Inside their small kitchen, which is also a living room and a makeshift bedroom, a large refrigerator stands out. It is shiny and still has stickers from the store on it, even though it has been here for nearly five years. It was given to the family by the famous TV preacher and millionaire Prophet Mboro when Spiwe's death attracted national attention. Mboro runs a church, the Incredible Happenings Ministry. And if nothing else, he is a master of PR, always attracting media attention. It's in the middle of a sunny day, and the sound of the wooden beams expanding in the heat sounds like raindrops hitting the corrugated iron roof. Usually, Nombuiselo speaks for the family, and she will do so as well today. But while waiting for her to get ready, Spiwa's father Dan tells us a bit about his own life. He was born in 1950, 27 years before Nombuiselo, whom he met towards the end of apartheid after returning from exile. At the time, Snake Park wasn't the urban area it is today, but mostly just farmland. Dan grew up in the much older township of Alexandra, raised mostly by his brothers who were part of the notorious Msomi gang of the 1950s. Yeah. They were hanged, the two brothers. Where? Pretoria. You're kidding, for what? For it was not so the Msomi gang. Mm. Sorry? They were what? part of the Msomi gang. Um, Somi is a very revered gang leader. Gang star. Mm -hmm. so, wow. so it was those days of the, the American gangs, yeah. the Russian gangs. And, and, uh, that one, a Nigeria gang star. So slow. Just to be clear, the Americans and the Russians are names of South African gangs and not nationalities. Later, he says, he left the country and joined the MK, the military wing of the ANC. So where did you go? You were in Angola? China and uh, Russia. He yeah. tells us how he trained in Angola and even China and Russia before returning to South Africa, where he met a teenage Nombuiselo. That time, not near this time, that time apartheid. Upright and fit. Dan doesn't look like he's almost 70. His life story weaves through the modern history of South Africa, but he only shares the headlines. And when Nombuiselo comes back and we get settled for the interview, Dan leaves the room and goes outside to continue his work on the car. None of us have been looking forward to this interview because we are going to ask Nombuiselo about the day her son died. But also because we have to question the version of events she gave me earlier. Since I first took down her story, we have gotten hold of the court transcripts. From those, we know that a Somali man named 
Sheikh Abdi Hashi Yosef was arrested, but soon after released on bail. In the end, he received a fully suspended sentence. He didn't have to serve any time. We had spoken to enough people in the neighborhood, most of them off the record, to know that different versions of events existed depending on who was doing the talking. But one thing was certain. It was at the Waka Waka shop, around the corner from the Mahoris, where it all started. So it was very unlikely that the commotion which began at the shop that afternoon wouldn't have been heard at the Mahori house. And just tell us about the whole day. Uh, I wake up in the morning. Then I'm preparing for the children to go to school. When Spiwi came back home, his father sent him out again. He said him to go to the shop to buy his cold drink. Just because his father, he liked cold drink so much. Cold drink and tea is his favorite. Then he go. Spiwi should have come back soon. The Waka Waka shop is just around the corner. But he didn't. And soon Nombui Selo went out to look for his son. So I want to see where, where he's going to or where he, he is. Then I go, I'm looking, I'm looking. I saw a crowd of children, but I didn't see him. According to the media reports, Nombui Selo and other witnesses, what she saw was the culmination of a conflict that began earlier that day. It all started when a young man, both the media and the community calls a Nyaupe boy, tried to enter the Waka Waka shop, and the shopkeeper tried to stop him. The young man is named Bongani, and both he and his mother are neighbors of the Mahoris. Bongani started all this thing. This thing is gone with my child. Even now, when I see Bongani, I tell him, Nobachalo would see any bullet say umtanam. Nabagawing a kalanga bongan lent to the gov umtanam as a corn. The fact that Bongani is a known drug user, a Nyaupe boy, seems to be both a description of him and the explanation for what he did. There is this boy who is called Bongani. Bongani, he's, he, he's a smoker. This is Norman Dingi, who lives two doors down from the Mahoris. He lives in a shack behind his mother's house. He is a single father, raising two sons. One of them was a friend of Spiwe. Besides this, he cares for his elderly uncle, who suffers from dementia. On the day of the killing, Norman passed by the Waka Waka shop on his way home from work. Bongani, he, he, he doesn't listen to anyone, to even his mom, and he wanted to force himself inside. What happened next is hard to say with certainty. Because while we have several accounts from people who were there or claimed to have been, as well as the media reports from the time, they tell slightly different stories. But what all agree on is that when the shopkeeper stopped Bongani from entering the shop, he got angry. He started throwing rocks. At some point, the shop attendant appeared with a gun and tried to force Bongani to leave. This immediately changed the dynamics. The crowd of people who had gathered around the Waka Waka shop had until then mostly stayed out of the conflict. But, as witnesses say, they got angry when they saw the shopkeeper with a weapon. Somebody called the police, apparently to get them to search the shop for illegal firearms. Again, there are different versions of what happened next. Some say that the police did not find any weapons because they were bribed to look the other way. Others say more than one gun was found. All agree that once the police had come and gone, Nothing was resolved. The community was angry and the situation escalated further. And this is also why Nombuiselo says she couldn't find her son. So I think in that time, 
when the, 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 that, that crowd is running, maybe he was there, but I'm not sure. Maybe he didn't find the cold drink there. Then started with him to go with that crowd. I don't know what's happening. But we know Spio was there because one of the neighbors, Susan Opperman, saw him. I she explains that she saw the commotion at the Waka Waka shop on her way home from work. After starting the preparations for dinner, she went out again to check on what was happening. Near the shop, she saw Spiwe, who explained that it was their neighbor Bungani who had caused trouble and then had been chased away. Mpumelolo waited around with Spiwe before heading home, urging him to do the same. You will get hurt if you stay outside, she warned him, before leaving him by the gate to his own house. And sure enough, at some point after this, the situation at the Waka Waka shop escalated further. Young men formed search parties and they began heading out to the foreign-owned shops in the area to search for illegal weapons. This is when the looting began. When the police come to that shop, they are going again. There is another shop at that side. So I'm just Going around outside there, I'm just looking, my child, where was my child, where, 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 where? I'm just looking in that crowd, where my child, maybe, but I didn't see him. Then I come back. Dan blames the foreigner who shot his son and partly all the immigrant shopkeepers along with him. Nombuiselo partly blames the neighbor, Bongani, and all the Nyaupe boys with him. But maybe there was more at stake than just Nyaupe boys. We spoke to Bongani, who acknowledges that he was there when the trouble began, but it wasn't his fault, he says. He just went into the shop to get out of the rain, and then the shopkeeper accused him of stealing. That's when he defended himself. But Bongani also says something else. <laughs> He confirms what we've heard in the neighborhood, but no one was willing to say on the record that once the conflict escalated, the local ANC councillor was called to the scene. Bongani and several anonymous sources say it was Jabulani Tom. He fanned the flames, we were told, and directed people with a whistle and said it was time for the foreigners to leave. Yeah. He not only allowed the looting to happen, but he actively directed it, according to Bongani. At the time, there were two councillors in Snake Park. Neither of them wanted to be interviewed for this podcast. But a year after the attacks, a TV crew from SABC interviewed one of them, Jabulani Tom. Here, he said something nearly every politician and police official will tell you. That the attacks on shops owned by immigrants had nothing to do with xenophobia at all. The resentment was not because of uh, xenophobic reasons. 
it was uh, maybe started by a criminal act. In a way, Nombuiselo agrees with this version. She remains angry with Bongani and other Nyaupe boys. Had it not been for them, she says, she would not have had to hear what a group of boys shouted as they came running down the street later in the evening. There's some guys, child Nyaupe boys, like maybe 14, 15, is, is coming to call, start calling us at the gate. He said, Mama has piwe, Mama has piwe. Then I started to jump. Mama has piwe, piwe, do you leave? I said, what? The boys said that piwe had been shot. And Nombuiselo wasn't the only one who heard them shouting. So when they, they, these boys were shouting, Mama has piwe, they shouted once. And then they shouted for the second time. As they shout for the second time, they said, Papa which means Pio has been shot. It's Pio has been shot. It's shocked to hear that because I just saw, saw the boy like 30 minutes. Now, now, now. Just saw the boy. Now the boy has been shot. You see. By then I was already wearing my pyjamas. It was already late. Wearing my pyjamas and my paka pakas. Took my paka pakas and go out. Went out. Take the key again. Go and open the gate. Norman was already in his pyjamas, but he went out anyway, and he met one of his neighbors, Leslie. As I was outside, I couldn't see anyone. The boys were already left. Luckily, the na- my neighbor was going out. He heard the noise too. Leslie doesn't want to be interviewed for this podcast, but he confirms the story that Norman tells. We, we, we ran, man. We you, ran. You're running? We ran, yes. We ran from here to Block 3. Because it's quite, it's quite a, a distance, yeah. quite a distance. So we, we had to run. We, we were running like no, not knowing which, where, where exactly the boy has been shot. And we, we, we were asking, going around asking, hey guys, where, where, is, this, where is this guy? Yeah, we hear there's a boy who's been shot, where is him? So they were busy directing us. And that's people who are in the street? Coming back, oh. coming back from where it was happening. When the two men arrived at the scene, they saw a large group of people gathered around the Russell's puzzle shop. Today, the shop is called the Royal Supermarket. The boys were standing in, on top of the, the walls, on, on top of the walls. The boys that were around there, how would you describe them? Will you say that they are around the same age as the people? Are they older? Are they younger? Are they angry? They were everyone, man, from girls to boys. Most, they, they, it was everyone there. But also, also adults. Uh, the adults were there, you see. And they wanted to force themselves inside the shop because there are many people and no one is trying to help Spiwe. They shot him while they were inside and then he fell right in front of the door. No one moved him. He fell in front of, in front of the door. But on the sidewalk, Spiwe was alone, still breathing. He was lying facing up because he was shot in the neck. He was shot this side, but he had the hole in another side, you see. So I didn't realize about the next hole. I only saw one hole. I only came to realize the second hole later, at the later stage with Norman. This boy has two holes. So I tried to stop this side, then see with Norman. The other blood is coming other side. So I had to take my shirt and divide it into two parts and... You see, just to stop, to, to, to stop the bleeding. When we get there, we found my child is laying down. There are, there are many people there. No police, no nothing, but they are, they are busy to call the police, call the ambulance, but no answer, no... Nombuisela was desperate to get hold of an ambulance and she couldn't get through on the phone. So she left her son in Norman's arms and ran down the street to find a way to get her son to the hospital. She was hoping that she would find the police responding to the looting and that they would be able to convince the operator to send an ambulance right away. When I see the site, I saw the van of the police. They are coming. Then I'm starting to stand, standing inside of the street. Then I'm stopping that van. 
then I'm telling him, no, 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 please help us. We need the ambulance. My child is laying down there. We need the ambulance. Please help us. I know if we were the police, the police, if, if they are calling the ambulance, we know the, the ambulance will come now. In front of the shop, where at least two Somali shopkeepers were still holed up inside, surrounded by an angry crowd, Norman was still holding Spiwe, urging him to hang on until the ambulance would arrive. I was trying to speak to the boy. I was trying to speak to the boy. I, I was trying to tell the boy not to go to sleep. His eyes were rolling like... You could see which he, he, he's in pain and he couldn't talk. Like, you see. Spiwe's father, Dan, was already losing hope. He was... He was losing his mind because he couldn't touch the boy. When he, when, he, when he came there, he just looked at the boy and said, my boy is dead, but in Tonga, in their language, said, my boy is dead. And by then, I remember this pure was not yet taking, taking his last breath out, but his father could see that his, his, his boy is like losing, um, but he couldn't touch him. By then he was alive. Spio was alive. He was like trying to talk, trying to say something, but I couldn't hear him because he he was whispering. At this point, Nombuiselo was on her way back to the scene. Through the police, she had managed to get hold of an ambulance that was finally on its way. Meanwhile, Norman was desperately trying to speak to Spiwe. If he kept talking, he thought, the boy wouldn't die. And he was trying to answer me back, but I couldn't, I couldn't hear what he was saying because he was like... Uh, so I couldn't hear what he was saying, but I was telling him, don't shut your, don't, don't shut your, don't shut your, your eyes, let's talk, let's talk, trying to speak to him, you see. At this point, Nombuiselo was at her son's side. The paramedics had arrived, but too late for it to matter. My child is, is dying. And then they tell us, no, your child is gone. There are different accounts about how much time passed between the time that Spiwe was shot and when the ambulance arrived. But when he was pronounced dead at 10.30, he had at least been on the sidewalk, still breathing, for more than 30 minutes. Some estimates it was more than an hour or even close to two hours. The next day, the bureaucracy of an untimely death began. First, Nombuiselo had to go to identify her son. She saw his body while the autopsy was ongoing. And when she finally got home, she spoke to the investigating officer, Raven Ramutan, who came to take her statement. The holder of the case, then he came and told me that he, he will come back to tell me who to tell me about the case. Then the, they say he, he will make the following up about the case, but he didn't do that. In a slim folder of important family documents, Nombuiselo pulls out a small piece of paper. It is half a page torn from a pocket notebook. Here, the investigating officer Ramotan has written his name, a case number, and his phone number. This is the only documentation Nombuiselo has ever gotten from the investigation of what happened to her son, she says. And no one ever picked up the phone when she called. She says she never heard anything from Detective Ramatan again. This isn't true, Detective Ramatan told my colleague Tanya. Um, I, I don't know, is it a good time to just chat for a minute just so I can explain things yeah, to no, you? Yeah, no, no problem. I'm just driving, but I'm close to the station. You can talk to me. Okay, great. 
I actually am just calling. I don't know if you had a chance to look up the case at all or... Uh, there was no need to look at it. Uh, I can recall that case. Is it where the, where, where the child was shot in front of the shop? That's right. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I remember that case because I was also, when I got a sentence, I, I think that sentence was a suspended sentence. Yeah. Yeah. And then I told my partner, check this thing out. This guy got a suspended sentence for murder. The only problem is I did explain the mother that there's no complaint. You cannot complain from the police side. We did our job. She has to go to the justice system, like, you know, to the courts, because they gave the sentencing, not us as police officers. D- did you d- did you talk to her then? Yes. Uh, you remember? I'm just talking to my partner. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. He was with me. I went to her with my colleague, my partner. And then we explained that, that the situation. I, okay, look, as family members, you know, they don't understand how we work. And did you tell them about the court, though, that, like, you know, that, that you know, they they could come to the court? Because I understand that that's the job of the investigating officer. Yes, I did tell them. I, I, I told them the court date, and then they went. And that's when they came to me to tell me that they, this is the same. Then I said they must wait for the docket to come. Because the, I will not tell you if I know what's happening if the docket's in court. So when the docket comes back, that's when I read the sentence, and then I went to this lady, and I told her, ma'am, you are right, this is a sentence. Because I, I thought maybe she must heard the, you know, the, the sentencing. Because they said they never were in court, and they never were heard by the judge, and they never knew that the sentencing was happening. No, ma'am. You know, people will come with allegations, in it, and I'm, I'm used to it now. So do you think that you, we could come through on Friday and you could pull the docket and we could come through and, and talk? Let's make it for Monday we can confirm and then we can do it in next week. We had tried for months to get an interview with Detective Ramatan. We had obtained permission from his boss, the station commander at Dobsonville Police Station. But when the time came to do the interview, he handed the phone to his superior, Cornell Mbata who rejected the request. Subsequently, we were told by the communications officer at the station that Ramatan did follow up with the Mahori family. Nombuiselo maintains she never heard from him again. He didn't tell me anything. I swear to God. She wasn't asked to testify, and she wasn't even told the date of the bail hearing or the final court date. She does not know what the investigation revealed. The only thing she knows is that the man who shot her son walked free, while she was never heard. Not knowing makes the pain worse, she says. My mother is passed away after that boy. But him, I understand he was sick. But this one is not okay with me. Numbuiselo blames the Nyaupe boys for starting the problems. Dan blames the foreigners. But what they don't say outright, but hangs in the air in their house, is that they blame themselves too. If what happened was a clash between locals and foreigners, possibly fueled by local political interests, what was their son doing there? If it was criminals, Nyaupe boys, taking advantage of the situation, why could they not keep their son away from the bad influence? Or, in other words, was Spiwe a victim or a perpetrator? Or was he both? Norman, the neighbor who held Spiwe when he died, has his own thoughts. You know, you know kids, they, they, they always like to play. Although you, they could play with the matches, they could play with a knife. But when they are they are playing. They can play with the dangerous things, because like they are playing. What you are hearing in the background is the St. Peter's Choir. They are practicing in the community hall across from the shop where Spiwe died. It is Sunday. The sun is shining and it's hard to imagine the violence that swept through the township on that night in Snake Park. But the sunshine is deceiving because 
While we still don't know exactly what the factors that played into the violence that night were, we know that they are still here, boiling under the surface. Next time on One Night in Snake Park. If we like go to Qatar, go to China, go to any country in the Middle East, we confine with their norms and standards. We don't, we don't do whatever we want. When our foreigners come into this country, they must also confine with our norms. Reporting for this podcast by Tanya Pampaloni, Elliot Moleba, Neo Rajani, and Rasmus Bits. Additional reporting by Paul McNally and recording assistance by Andreas Hammer Holmerfield. Original score by John Batman. Editing by Rasmus Bits. Tanya Pompoloni is executive producer. J.D. Ramalapa is the editor in chief of Sound Africa. <laughs>